Praise the Lord. Good morning. Such an honor and privilege for my wife, Ellen, and myself to be with you this morning. I praise God for you, and I thank God for a wonderful and a missionary uh, church. Thank you so much for inviting me to share also this uh, morning. Uh, I love the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, even though I did not know him for many years, I was born in Nazareth. I was raised and lived in Cana of Galilee. My house or our house was attached to the wedding church where many thousands of tourists, they come and see the church. I always asked in myself, why do people come and see stones and historical churches? Until one day a missionary from the United States, he came from my hometown and he asked me a question. Do you know Jesus? For the first time, I was uh, puzzled because I did not understand what he meant by his question. He repeated the question a second time. He said, do you know Jesus? Have you accepted him into your life? At this point, I looked in his eyes and I said to him, of course I know Jesus. He's from my hometown, from Nazareth. And right here in, in the neighborhood, he changed water into wine. I thought I impressed him with this answer, but he said something that began the journey of faith in my life. He said, I know that you know about Jesus. My question is not knowing about him, but knowing him, experiencing him personally. And um, at some point, I uh, received Jesus, but it was not only a faith in Jesus, but it was a total and full surrender, dedication, consecration to the ministry, to serve and to witness about the Lord Jesus Christ. From that moment on, I began to witness, I began to, um, to preach uh, the gospel, and the Lord opened a great door, and specifically in media. I had the privilege to start the first television program in Arabic language, in, in the Arab world. And today we are seen in many countries, and many millions are watching, and thousands of Muslims and non-Muslims are receiving the gift of uh, salvation. So that is my passion, that is my dedication, that's what I do, and that's what I live for, is basically to win souls for Jesus Christ. This morning, I have a message on my heart, and this message is focusing on missions, because I believe Jesus Christ is the greatest missionary. He came to our earth, an earth full of sin, of hatred and animosity, and he brought peace, reconciliation, and most importantly, he brought salvation and justification and he brought eternal life and to be with him eternally once we accept and receive his gift of salvation. Um, I would like to read from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, beginning with verse 34. John, chapter 4, beginning with verse 34. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman 
who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard, have heard him, and we know that this indeed the Christ, the Savior of uh, the world. May the Lord bless his word. Mission is possible. It's possible for many reasons. But let me first of all give you about the background of what's going on in the time of Jesus. Jesus, the Bible speaks in verse 4 in the same chapter, he must go through Samaria. And we know from culture, rabbis or Jewish rabbis do not go through Samaria lest they will be defiled. So what they do, if they are in Judea, they will go eastward to the Jordan River. Then they travel beyond the Jordan River and they go back like a circle into the Galilee to avoid to enter into a, a Samaritan territory which considered the enemies of the people of God. That animosity started in 722 B.C., when the Assyrians took the ten tribes of the north and they brought other nationalities into the region. So they intermarried and they um, mixed together. So when the Jews came from the Babylonian captivity, for them was terrible, horrible, and they could not even deal with the Samaritans. More worse, the Samaritans only believed in the Torah. The five books of Moses denying the rest of the scripture. And the animosity grew up specifically between the testaments during the time of Maccabeans. To the point by the time Jesus came, if anyone wanted to say a bad word, they will say, you are a Samaritan. And in fact, they said this about Jesus. You are a Samaritan that is equivalent of Satan. So we have to, um, to realize in those days, the, po politically it was very hot. And also in terms of uh, religious, there are many religious uh, groups. And Jesus was not pressured by the political situation of his day. Neither he was pressured by the circumstances by what to do or not to do. Simply, basically, he looked at the human soul. And that was the most important thing for Jesus is the human soul. Because we are created in God's own image. We are the subject of his love. And we are the subject of his care. And we are the subject of his plan of redemption. Jesus, not only he spoke in public and for uh, groups, but all, he also, in the Gospel of John, we see that he dealt with many individuals. This individual specifically was not from the people of God. She was from a different race. And yet Jesus moved through the power of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and everything he did, he was to appease and please his father. So when he went through Samaria in his plan to meet with individual. And that individual is a woman. According to the Jewish tradition, it is better to burn the words of the law than, uh, than giving it to a woman. How much worse to give it to a Samaritan woman who is considered enemies of the people of God. And yet Jesus approached her and he went to speak with her. And that's why I wanted to say no matter what race, no matter what nationality, no matter what who and what we are dealing with, the most important thing to understand, mission is possible 
because of many reasons. One, because of the priority of mission. Well, in this situation, the priority for Jesus was individual. She was a woman. Jesus came to the well of Sikar in Samaria, close to Nablus today, and the well still today exists in the Greek Orthodox Church, and he was hungry. The disciples went to buy bread. He was tired. He sat at the well, and yet he was thirsty. He has no pot to draw the water, so he was waiting. As he was waiting, a woman, Samaritan woman, came to the well, and Jesus triggered a conversation with her. And we can see that he was a master communicator because he did not start with the Samaritan woman by declaring that he is the Messiah and he is talking to her from above to law, but rather he expressed a need. He approached and he dealt with her humanity. Culturally in the Middle East, if you have enemy, when you ask him a glass of water, this is where you break the animosity. Jesus was a master communicator because she was a priority, because he communicated to her humanity that he is in need. He is in need for water. However, he turned the whole topic from his need to the physical water, to her need, to the spiritual water. Then he appealed not only for humanity, her humanity. He appealed to her mind. He made her think. He asked questions. He, she puzzled. She said, how could you ask me? And you have no uh, part to draw water. So he made her think. He appealed also to her spirituality. Because that is the conversation in the Middle East. If you want to speak about Jesus... Always start with a spiritual topic. So they spoke about the kind of worship. She talked about the well of Jacob who gave it to Joseph. Therefore, she had knowledge of some scripture. She had knowledge who was Jacob, Joseph. And she had knowledge about worship because the Samaritans built a temple on Mount Gerizim. And they believed this is the worship place. Uh, but it was destroyed during the Maccabeans' time. So Jesus drew her attention to the true worship, not in Jerusalem, not on Mount Gerizim. So he appealed to her humanity. But also Jesus destroyed her beliefs. That's very important in communication. He destroyed because for us in the Middle East, we deal with people who are antagonistic to the gospel. Therefore, everything we speak, we say, we have to explain what we say and what we express. For example, if we say redemption, we have to go through the process of explaining the word. If we say Jesus is the son of God, we have to go through a process by explaining what is the son of God, how people could perceive or understand this expression. Therefore, he had to destroy some beliefs in her so that he can approach her in the truth and also in the spirit. But most importantly with communication, he made her to make a decision. And that decision, when he pointed to the right hurt that she, he said, Go and bring your husband. She had five husbands, and the sixth that she lives with was uh, not her husband, but she was living in sin. So she realized, she understood that this man, Jesus Christ, came specifically, and she was a priority for him. To the point she left the jar, she ran to the city, and she told her city, and brought her city back to Jesus to, to listen to the gospel, to the good news. Our priorities is people. You see, the most difficult thing for any church, when we lose hope, 
when we lose our vision, when we lose our passion, when we lose our love, when we lose our purpose and the priorities in what to do and how we do it. Therefore, what are the priorities for us as a church in terms of mission? And this is very important because as we see, it doesn't take much wisdom. All that it takes is just go outside of the church and behold is the field is everywhere, is ready and is ripe. But the question, the true question, what is your priority? You see, in, in our ministry, we reach millions of people. We reach all the Middle East, North Africa, and we deal with masses of groups. But the most important thing, when I speak to one individual, to one person, when you know how to communicate with one person, this is where and how you can communicate with others or with the masses. But always it starts with one. And I always put this challenge before everyone. You have a year. You have a year to win one soul. So you can pray, you can call, you can communicate, you can disciple, you can follow up, you can be with that person for one year. Can you imagine? If every person takes this commitment and make it a priority to win one soul, what would be the case in our church here? So it is possible because of the priority. Everyone can testify. Everyone can share about Jesus. Everyone can win that one soul to the Lord of Jesus Christ. To me, that is the greatest joy. You know, on Facebook last year, we had more than 37 million people came through our site. And we have, we cover 13 satellite stations in many languages, in Arabic. We translate into Urdu language, into Farsi, into Turkish. And yet is when you speak with one person and you win that person, what a joy. What a joy it brings to your heart, like it changed your view of the world. It will change your view of Jesus. It will change your view of yourself when you are filled with the joy of the Lord. Secondly, purpose of the mission. So what was the purpose? It's very simply, Jesus stated in verse 34, he said, my food is to do the will of him and to finish his work. Now, uh, notice this is the coin that has two sides. One side, Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him. If I exist and food is the sustenance of life, if I exist and the purpose of my existence is to do the will of the Father, but the other side of the coin to finish his work. See, so many times we start something, but we do not finish. And the most difficult to anyone, to any person, when you have a dream in your mind, you have a vision in your heart, and years pass, and you feel that you are not fulfilling your dream. You are not fulfilling the purpose. Why? God has created you. God has a purpose for every individual here, for every one. For Jesus, it was very clear. It's not the need. It's not the pressures, whether politically or from the religious side. It was to do the will of the Father. 26 times in the Gospel of John, the Bible speaks that Jesus came to do the will of the Father and to finish his work. We see that stated two times when he prayed in John 17. He stated that the work the Father has given to him, he has finished. And when he was on the cross, he said, it is finished. 
what a joy, what a satisfaction when he fulfilled the plan that he came to do, the plan of redemption. Likewise, we see in the life of the Apostle Paul, Paul from the first moment he saw the risen Lord on the road to Damascus, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he kept on the course all his life until the last moment when he stated to his son Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, when he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. You see, for Jesus, that was the main purpose is to, to do the will of the Father and to finish his work. The most uh, important thing about consecration is not only to please God, but to satisfy his heart. And that is dedication when they used to offer the burnt offering on the sacrifice. God will smell the sweet aroma and he will be appeased and pleased. He will be satisfied. You see, if we, feel, if we live in our lives unfulfilled and yet we have a task, we have something to do. So here he is speaking not only about his vision, not only about his passion, but he, talk, he speaks about, about task. You know, he finished the task. And that is very, that's the plan of action that he puts ahead of him. So when we have a plan of action and we finish that, it's the most fulfilling thing in your life. What is the enemy doing these days? We call it spirit of confusion or disorder. So many people reach a point that we cannot even discern the voice of God. We cannot discern what's going on. We cannot discern the times and season. What's going around us, everything has a purpose. Even the refugees, whether you accept or reject, they are here in Canada for a purpose. Why not to discover what is the purpose and what can we do? But also God has a season everywhere. And God has a purpose. I have been serving the Lord for many years, but in the last eight or nine years, I have been going to Iraq, then Syria, and it was during the war. I saw the suffering. I saw the pains. I saw hundreds of thousands running only with their clothes. I have seen people. They lived a normal life like you and me. The teacher, the engineer, the doctor, the business, every type of work. They are happy in their homes. Within one night, they had to leave everything. Even on the border, they have to take from them the ring and the phone. So they were left nothing without anything. I just came back from Australia. I met someone who lost uh, 63 stores that he has in Iraq, all over Iraq. They were destroyed completely by ISIS. And so many people lost so many things. But you know, when you deal with, uh, with a ministry in the right timing, this is where you see the fruit. We've seen a breakthrough in Iraq. We've seen many people coming to believe in Jesus. And in the last four years, I've been going to Syria. The Lord gave me favor in the eyes of the government. And also the, uh, the Kurdish side. The ministry is growing there. Now what we hear on the news is sad, bad, and negative news. But in God's eyes, when we have the spiritual eyes, we can see differently. God is at work. God is changing lives. Just recently, I met the head judge there. She had a cross. I said, oh, you are a Christian. She said, yeah, I hate Islam. I hate the violence. I, so I decided to leave Islam. Then I said to her, 
you cannot be a Christian because you hate Islam. You be a Christian because you will fall in the love of Jesus because you need to receive salvation. So I began to speak about salvation. She accepted the Lord. Her husband accepted the Lord. Her children accepted the Lord. And today we started five churches in that region. Just three months ago, we baptized 34 believers from that region. It's simply because the season is ripe. So when you have a purpose and you are moving toward that purpose, God will do his part. God will open the door and God will open the way and your ministry and your life will be productive. Therefore, you live satisfied because you have a clear purpose and that purpose for missions is to honor and to glorify Jesus Christ. Thirdly, let's see you know, about the missions, the passion. Jesus said in verse 35, Do you not say there are still four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. They are white for harvest. All that Jesus said, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. Unfortunately, in the Holy Land, we don't have massive lands like Canada. You could fly four or five hours over fields, you know, especially when you go to Alberta. In Israel, what we do is basically we depend on God. If it rains, it's a blessing. If it doesn't rain, it's a judgment, according to the scripture I'm quoting now. So what farmers do there is simply they clear the stones and they build terraces on hills and mountains. When it rains, the soil comes and fills the terrace. So they plant the terraces. So everywhere you look in Israel, it doesn't take much, you know, or wisdom, everywhere you look, you see fields even on the hills and the mountains. And Jesus likened that, that the harvest is ripe. In fact, he said white. And of course, here he's talking about wheat, which the harvest comes after the Passover, seven weeks. It's called the Feast of Pentecost or Shavuot, the weeks in the Hebrew language. This is the time for harvest. But Jesus had a greater vision, a greater look. He said, when you look, look at the fields. It's ripe. It's almost white, ready. It's white, it's ready to harvest. And what I could sense from the language, I could sense Jesus was passionate about what he speaks about what he says. And if we lose our passion, the next generation will lose everything. If we are passionate, then people can tell that you are passionate. It's like, uh, you know, salespeople when they sell you. I don't know, every time someone tried to sell me something, you can ask my wife. They convince me for some reason. I buy things I don't need to buy. But why? Because they are passionate on what they sell. And sometimes I feel as a church, we need to be passionate. We need to be passionate so the world can see our passion, our love for Jesus Christ. Have you seen a game? Like, have you been in a football game? Let me tell you about the, uh, the Middle East. When there is a soccer game, you feel like it's World War III. People are so excited. They are so passionate. I'm sure likewise it is here. We come to the churches, it's like it's a different story. You know, the world, when they see our passion and what we believe and what we love, that what will convince the world around us. 
I remember we lived in Jerusalem for um, six years. One time, a guy, a young man from Hamas organization, he accepted Jesus. I was uh, doing the discipleship for him for three weeks at night, sometimes at 11 until 2 o'clock in the morning. Then I have to drive him to his place because his family want to kill him. The army want to arrest him. So he was, you know, he lost everything. But boy, he was passionate. After three weeks, I took him to our Baptist church in, in Jerusalem. After the church, he was very excited. He said he began to uh, crack his, um, his bones. And he said, Nizar, I'm ready. I looked at him, ready for what? He said, I'm ready. I understood what he meant. Because when he was a, a Muslim before, every time after the preaching on Friday, they go and have demonstrations. And they are willing to die for their faith. And now he's, uh, he's at a Christian service. He thought that he had to do that same thing. I said, wait, wait a moment. We are not as suiciders. We love life. But if it takes us to die for Christ, we'll do it. But we don't just commit suicide. He said like this, I remember. But you have the truth. Why are you silent? Go and speak. You have the truth. So that passion that was in him really touched, said, wow, if we have young people like that, we have young people are willing to die for a false cause, whether politically or religious cause, and yet we are trying to be politically correct in Canada. I'm sorry to say that. We're trying to please everyone. It doesn't work like that. Jesus was passionate. Lift up your eyes and see. Once you see, you see the need. You see the harvest. You see the ministry. You see the work. This is when you begin to move with love, with passion, and with the strength of uh, the Lord. Number four, it's partnership in mission. Look uh, verse 36. Do you not say there are still four months? Then 36, he who reaps, receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. So, here, Jesus is talking about the principle of partnership. Partnership in mission. Take it. There is no one organization or one church or one person can do all the work. It's a myth. It's a heresy. The work. I was in Billy Graham's conference. I was on the theology committee when they said it's the ministry of the whole church preaching the whole gospel. The whole church to the whole world. In other words, if there is no partnership, we cannot achieve the plan of God. Here he talk about the sower, the one who sows, and the one who reaps. But both gather fruit for eternal life that may bring them joy. So when there is harvest, there is a joy in the book of Psalms. When there is harvest, we gather, but not only the fruit, we gather for eternal life that we may rejoice, rejoice together as partners. And we cannot fulfill any mission, any ministry without partnership. So we are partners with God and we are partners with one another, believe it or not. We are in the body of Jesus. We are the members in the same body. You and I, it doesn't matter where you come from. We are one body. Jesus, when he gave the great commission, he said, go preach the gospel to every creature. 
to every ethnic group, making disciples of all nations, witnessing be beginning in Jerusalem to the uttermost of the earth. That was the plan of Jesus. How we fulfill it? In partnership. Partnership, basically, I say, I can't do it without you. We need the whole body, the whole giftings, the whole possibilities, everything to put it into one work. So to see the vision, the mission of Jesus being fulfilled in our generation. Second Corinthians chapter 6, ver verse 1. The Bible says, we are co-workers with him. With God. Now, this is a very difficult concept uh, for me. I understand we are partners, but p we partner with God. That's very difficult. And likewise, he said it again in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul said, we are co-partners, co-workers with God. How can I partner with God? And yet God, who is the one who does the work through the power of of the Holy Spirit. I couldn't understand this until one day I was uh, helping my father-in-law at the farm. And I was carrying those big round bales. So I'm carrying it, second floor, trying to divide it, put it, throw it to the f down to the first floor for the cows. My son David, I think he was uh, three years old. He said, Daddy, can I help you? I looked at him. I said, sure, come. So he put his tiny hand. I was carrying this big bill and threw it in the hole and he screamed, yeah, daddy, yeah, daddy, we did it. We did it. And I felt at that moment, the Lord spoke to me. That's exactly what he does. So we rejoice as though we are doing the work. But in fact, he is doing the bigger part. Therefore, we are partners with him. But partner with, a, with one another, this is extremely important. That is the spirit of unity. That is the spirit of love. And that is a spirit that we do not focus on one another, but we focus on the honor and the glory of Jesus Christ. We need all the giftings. We need all the means. I thank God for so many people who support Light for All Nations. So we can go and preach the gospel. As a result, many churches have begun. Many lives have been changed. Because we work together, whether in sending, whether in giving, whether in praying. And whether in, in really just planning all that. So we are one. We are together. The spirit of togetherness. We are one. That is partnership in mission. Finally, power of mission. The power of mission does two things. One, it breaks all the obstacles between the Samaritans and the Jews. And secondly, it builds bridges, more bridges to reach other. We have seen this in, in the missions, in the work of the Lord. We've seen people who were against Jesus, and yet they come to Jesus. I remember I was speaking in a conference, and uh, I asked people to come forward. So people, I was praying for people. There is a guy in the back. He's about two meters height, one meter wide. His beard, maybe half meter also. And he is looking like with fiery eyes. I said, oh, this guy, he's going to kill me. So he's, he's really looking straight into my eyes. And as I was giving them, you know, the opportunity, he began to walk. He's looking at me straight into my eyes. So I, while I'm, you know, dealing with the people, I'm, t you know, watching him. Because the year before, I was praying with someone, believe it or not. He came just about half meter. He took the knife 
and he wanted to stab me. So two brothers, they caught him. So as this guy was um, coming down towards me, I began to think, well, for those who don't know, I used to be a professional boxer, okay? So I began to think, okay, he's coming. I'll give him the left. If he does anything, then with the right, I'll knock him out. This is what I'm thinking. So he came and he stood right in front of me, his eyes still fire like in his eyes. He spoke like a robot. You know, you turn on a robot, just four, four words. He said like this, I am from ISIS. I came to kill you. I heard the message. I want to be a Christian, just like that. And I said, come here. I took him and hugged him. I thought I was planning how to knock you out. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's the power of the gospel. You know, uh, believe me, there is no other word. I studied Eastern religions. There is no like Jesus. There is no like the Bible. Nothing. There is power in this word. When you speak the word with the spirit and truth and in the right time, it will change lives. It will change people. One time I was um, uh, like, you know, speaking on TV. There is this Moroccan woman. She married to an imam. And this imam, her husband, every day he comes and beats her. So one day he came and he beat her. And he went to pray for some reason. So she began to question God. What kind of God? The injustice. And so she decided to commit suicide. As she was planning to commit suicide, she fell on the couch. And guess what? On the couch was a remote control with red button. It says power. So she fell on that. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> I hit my face. Uh, she hit that power and the TV was on and it was light for all nations. And at that moment, I was saying, Satan is coming to destroy lives. Jesus said, I came to give life and life in abundance. She was shocked. Who is Jesus, the one who's talking about? She called another Moroccan lady. Moroccan lady, she called another one. Finally, they reached someone who helps us in the ministry. And I was passing through her city. She accepted the Lord. I tell you, this gospel has broke many barriers and brought many people and bridged, uh, built bridges to people. And people are receiving Jesus. You know, one time I was speaking. And at the end, I gave invitation. Two ladies from Saudi Arabia, nationals from Saudi Arabia, they accepted Jesus. So they wanted the Bible. Uh, you know, they, ha they, they block our site in Saudi Arabia. So we began in other means to send them pieces uh, of the New Testament. Then they called after three weeks. They asked, we noticed that Jesus used to heal people. Is he still healing people? Now, I, I want to tell you something. There is something when you say something and when you are really faced with someone with a challenge, does really God or Jesus do these things? I said to her, yes. When we pray in faith and we believe, Jesus can heal. So they said, well, my uncle, their uncle, he is, um, he is sick in cancer, and the doctors gave him two months. I said, well, let's pray, and let's believe God. So I prayed, and they prayed also. After a few days, I forgot I prayed for them. So about three weeks or uh, four weeks, they called back. So uh, they said, oh, yes, Jesus is alive. And he does answer prayers. I said, what happened? Because I'm trying to remember what I did. She said, Jesus healed my, uh, my uncle from, from cancer. 
And he became a believer. He, his wife, and the three children accepted Jesus. There is power in the word of God when we go on mission. You see what happened? This woman was saved. She went, she went to the city. And she told the people. Now she was very smart. Because could it be the Messiah? Remember the culture. Jewish or Samaritan culture. They don't take the witness of a woman. It has to be more than one. It has to be two, three women. To take their testimony. She asked a question for them to come and see. So when they came in verse 39, they believed in Jesus. In, in 41, look at the human nature. L let me read it because they don't want to take the testimony of the woman. Verse 41. And many more believed because of his own word, Jesus' word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. It doesn't matter who says it, as long people get saved. So it doesn't matter what is the culture, Jesus is alive, and he can change lives. And this is the power of mission. When we speak about Jesus, there is power. It's not the rituals. It's not regulations. It's not just mere uh, like uh, services that we do on Sunday or in the middle of the week. There is something more live that can change people and draw people like magnetic, like a magnet. They come to the church. They come to Jesus because something had happened to them. That is the power of uh, mission. By uh, your permission, Pastor, can I add just one word? It's prayer for mission. And this context, we see a similar context in Matthew and in Luke, where Jesus said, the harvest is plenty. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest. So pray. There is power in prayer for mission. When I say prayer, don't say just bless him. Pray for him, for his wife, for his children. Because they are facing all kind of attacks. All kind of temptations. All kind of obstacles. And we pray for them so that the will and the purpose of God be fulfilled in our generation. And that is the plan of God. That is a possible mission. When we think about the priorities, when we think about the purpose for mission, when we are passionate for mission, when we partner together in mission, when we believe in the power of mission that when we speak, the word can bring change to lives. When we pray, we see the move of God, the Holy Spirit will convict hearts and draw people unto Jesus. That is my prayer for every individual. Now, many of us, maybe we lost the vision. Maybe we lost sense of purpose. Maybe we lost the passion. Maybe we lost our first love. We can't focus on priorities. We can't even know what we want to do. Day comes, day go. We're confused. We can't even hear. I pray in Jesus' name that today will be a day in your life where your dreams and visions are restored, where you put in your heart to win that one soul, you know, for Jesus Christ, and that will give you satisfaction, joy, and purpose in your life. Now, I wanted to pray now for, um, for the church. And I wanted to, um, to make it as a commitment. If really the Lord spoke to your heart and you want to do something, you want to do something, maybe you need to ask for clarity. Maybe you need to ask the Lord to, to show you, to reveal, to open your spiritual eyes, your spiritual ears to perceive what his plan for your life. 
Maybe you want to pray that no more confusion in your life, that there is a clarity in what you do. I would like to pray, but anyone needs prayer, please stand on your feet right now and let's pray. Let's bow our heads in prayer. And those who need prayer, you know, you really want to commit yourself. Say, you know what? I've been so many years coming to church, but now I want to do something. Maybe you want to pray. Maybe you want to go. Maybe you want to send. You know what? Maybe you want to give. Because this is called partnership. And if the Lord speaks to your heart to do something, even don't despise the little things. Don't despise something little. Because that little, like little oil, bless the whole family during the famine. For five loaves and two fish fed thousands of people. That little thing can do great things in the kingdom of God. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you. We honor you. And we thank you, Lord, for you have loved us an everlasting love. And you have demonstrated this love through your precious Son, the indescribable gift, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord Jesus, because you loved everyone. You went to the Samaritan woman, yet you can be with crowds. And yet you saw there was a heart, lonely heart, that needs to be reached, changed, and saved. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you remove any confusion, any disorder in our lives, that we can be tuned with God, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, so that we can move in your direction and to, be, uh, to, uh, to honor you and to enjoy doing your will. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you will fill us with your divine wisdom and understanding, with the power of God, the power of the word of God, that we can speak and we can reach lives. I pray, Lord, for every dream, for every vision will be rekindled, Lord, I pray for the fire of the Holy Spirit, not only to purify us, but to burn any selfish desires in us, but also that fire will grow to see many lives coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I pray for every brother, for every sister in this church. Bless them, Lord Jesus. And I pray for this commitment, Lord, one soul for a year. Lord, help us to win one soul this year. Lord, I pray for the pastor, for the leaders, and for this church, it will be a light. And Lord, it will be a witness to you in this city. Bless them. Provide every need in their lives. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that many precious souls will come to receive Jesus and fill this place. We love you. We honor you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.